Today on The Matt Wall Show, I'm going to share a few thoughts about my experiences at University of Maryland last night. I was giving a talk there on the left's war on reality, uh, and leftists on campus were, were not terribly thrilled to have me there, it turns out, uh, which of course is to be expected. But there were there's a few points I want to make about, about what happened last night. I want to talk about the incredible intellectual cowardice of left-wing campus protesters and how that cowardice is instilled by and encouraged by the universities in so many cases. And also, I want to talk about why labels like bigot and fascist don't mean anything anymore and have no effect. And so if you're someone who relies on using those labels to shut down debate or to try to win an argument, uh, maybe you've noticed that it doesn't seem to be working that well. Well, I want to explain why, so we'll talk about that. Also, five headlines, including the effort by thousands of people to try to shut down Pornhub. Now, even if you're not on board with the banning porn bandwagon, can we at least agree that a, a website like Pornhub should be, if not shut down, at least uh, heavily regulated? We'll talk about that. And today in our daily cancellation, I have to unfortunately cancel some people who are very close to me uh, personally. I don't want to do it, but I have to, and uh, I'll explain why. And I think after I explain, you'll, you'll understand my decision. And in our email section today, uh, we will uh, I'll answer a couple of emails, including one from Andrew, who wants to tell me why I'm wrong about uh, my stance on gay marriage. He apparently attended my talk last night and had issue, took issue with, with one of the things I said on, on gay marriage, thinks I'm wrong, and um, he'll try to make his case. So we'll get into all of that coming up. But first, um, yeah, so I, wanna, I went to College Park last night, University of Maryland, to give my war on reality speech. And there were flyers and leaflets that went up around campus before I showed up there, warning people about me, saying, be very careful, um, encouraging everyone to stay away because I, I am hazardous to your health, it turns out. Now, I showed you one of the flyers yesterday, and um, here's another one. I'll put it up on the screen for you. This one says, caution, this event is a threat to all LGBT plus people. Matt Walsh is a raging transphobe, homophobe, racist, and fascist. He is not arguing in good faith and advocates for the crim... Well, actually, it says the criminalization. The criminalization and institutionalization of all LGBT plus people. This is the kind of rhetoric that gets us killed. We will not entertain debate about whether uh, everyone deserves rights and basic human dignity. On behalf of the LGBT student population of UMD, do not engage with this speaker or attend his event. Leave now. By participating in this event, you are endangering all LGBT people and cannot claim goodwill toward any of us. Now, for the people who did show up, uh, you were endangering LGBT people just simply by being there. I don't know if you knew that. Leave now. Get out. Get out while you still can. And uh, they, they took this advice, at least the leftists did, people who disagreed with me. They did not show up. They did show up, I should say. They showed up outside of the room uh, where they were handling, handing out brochures and telling people not to come. But they didn't actually come in. As far as I could tell, not one of them came in to the talk itself. Uh, and I assume that because during the Q&A portion, many people went up to say something. There was, I, I received no challenge at all, no pushback from the left during the Q&A. Um, and I, I, I guess because they didn't come in, they were afraid I was going to kill them. I'm a threat to the lives of LGBT people, uh, which is really unreasonable. I mean, look, at most, okay, I will kill one person at my talks. Once I killed two people, but generally just one person. So it's just one, look, you kill one person at each talk and suddenly it's a big deal. And it's not a bigoted thing. It's more of a ritualistic thing to appease the gods. So we do, a, you know, it's, it's sort of a fun thing. It's audience participation. They all select one person. Uh, you know, we'll do it different ways. I'll take a volunteer. Most of the time there is no volunteer, surprisingly. But so then we'll, we'll talk about it as an audience. A lot of fun. And uh, we select one person. We kill them, uh, you know, just as a ritualistic thing. And then, then I get going with the talk. I, because here's, I, I took public speaking classes, and I learned that you always want to get the audience's attention first before you start talking. And what better way to get their attention than by ritualistically sacrificing someone to the gods? So that's it. Um, other than that, there's really no need for concern, I think. 
But um, I think, you know, actually, anyway, they, they weren't really worried that I'd physically kill anyone. They were worried that my words would kill people or get people killed. How is that? Why? In what way would my words get anybody killed? Nobody could explain. Nobody bothered explaining. They didn't come in to tell me. Now, also, as I said, they were handing out pamphlets outside the event. I managed to get my hands on one of these pamphlets. I want to show it to you in just a second because you have to see this thing. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty great. But before I do, I want to uh, uh, take a pause here uh, to talk about our friends over at Ashford University. We all have an idea of what our dream job would look like. Uh, I think we all, we all know what that is. My dream job is, is, uh, is doing this, which is not a job, so I don't really even have a job which is really my dream as a, as a lazy person. But a lot of people, you want to get a real job. And uh, someone's, you know, you're not just going to find someone who's going to hand it to you. Odds are you'll need at least a bachelor's degree to make that dream a reality. That's the way that it goes in society today. And I know it's hard to go back to school while you're still working. So if you're, you know, if you're, uh, especially you're, you're an adult, you got kids, you're a parent, uh, you want to go back to school. It'd be a very difficult thing to do. It's a very daunting thing to think about. But that's why you'll love Ashford University. Ashford University's online bachelor's and master's degree programs allow you to learn at your own pace. You can study wherever you're the most comfortable learning. Ashford University's six-week-long courses allow you to take one course at a time. Being enrolled in one class at Ashford means you are considered a full-time student, so you're taking on a, on a, a manageable workload, which will also work with everything else you got going on in your life. And we all have busy lives, and that's what Ashford University understands. You know, I, I know a number of people who, as adults, as parents, are saying, I want to go back to school. I want to get the degree. How am I going to do that? And that's why I tell them, you know, Ashford University uh, is, is the way to go because it's, it's going to work with your life. Uh, there are no standardized tests required either. The SAT, GRE, GMAT, other standardized test scores are not required for enrolling at Ashford University. So you can get on the road to earning your degree and making your dream job a reality. Enroll now by going to ashford.edu slash Walsh. That's ashford.edu slash Walsh to start your degree today. Ashford.edu slash Walsh. Okay, now, um, they were handing, okay, so they're handing out these brochures. Brochures. I don't know why I pronounce it that way. These brochures, uh, they were handing them out at, at the talk. And um, here's, here's what this one looked like. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, this is the, bro, the brochure. And it says, the war on reality. Well, actually, it says the, the war on realty. I'm not sure if that spelling mistake is on purpose or not. I don't know why it would be on purpose, the war on realty. Yeah, I'm in real estate. I guess I'm, I'm waging a war on real estate. As someone who's, who's, who's uh, sold a house twice now, in my life, I, I do kind of want to wage a war on real estate. Uh, and then it says, featuring Matt Wasp. Matt Wasp of the Daly Wire. Clever stuff. That's devastating. Remember, I've, I've, I've said in the past that it's very difficult for people to think of ways to change my last name in an insulting way. Go As a kid, many, many bullies tried and failed. Because Walsh is just, there's not a lot you can do with it. Here they try Wasp. Not even really correct, because WASP is white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. I'm Catholic, so really I'm a WASC. Um, and, uh, and then at the, it says, Young America's Foul Nation, rather than Foundation. And then inside, there's the same thing I showed you, the same uh, uh, poster thing about how I'm a, a transphobe. And then there's a whole, in, in the brochure, it lists a, a, a number of my very disturbing viewpoints. So it gives a a little bit of a rundown, a resume of all of my bigoted and horrific things that I believe and have said in my life. And um, just for example, it says voting rights. Matt Walsh staunchly endorses stripping people of the right to vote if he considers them to be ignorant or (laughs) non-contributing. I do. I do support that, actually. Uh, And specifically only wants people to vote if they pay taxes and have passed an eighth grade civics exam. Yes. What's the problem with that? Yes, I am fully on board with stripping lots of people of their voting rights. I've been very clear about this. I I unironically believe that millions of people should not have the right to vote who currently do. And I I think we should take that right from them. I absolutely believe that. If you can't pass an eighth grade civics exam, you have no business voting. I think you should not have the right to vote. This system was never set up to give literally every single person the right to vote. And it doesn't work that way. It, It doesn't work. 
We don't need every ignoramus, every non-contributing moron to vote. Um, that's not what the founding fathers had in mind. That's it, the system just doesn't work. Anyway, and then it goes through and a bunch of all my other things. Uh, Walsh spends much of his bandwidth attacking a handful of progressive figures such as Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Kaiser cortez um, yeah, yeah, that's true too. Anyway, it's very unfortunate that they didn't actually come into the room to, to the talk itself because I was really hoping that last night would be the night finally that after all of these many months of asking that I could finally get a leftist to define the word woman for me. You know, I, it's been my goal, as you know, to get someone on the left to offer a definition. I was really hoping it would happen last night during the Q&A, finally. Uh, but that hope and dream was dashed. Now, and, and so this is, this is the, the, the really unfortunate thing. It, the stifling, suffocating, intellectual cowardice of these people. It's, it's fun to laugh at and easy to laugh at. But to view opposing ideas as attacks, as mortal threats, rather than opportunities, opportunities to sharper, sharpen your own mental tools, to test your ideas and your perceptions, to engage with differing viewpoints, to grow as a person, rather than viewing it as that, they view it as a, a mortal threat to their very lives. And we've gotten so used to this that we're numb to it. And everybody says, yeah, well, that's the way it goes on college campuses. But let's not lose sight. It is the way it goes, but let's not lose sight of how extraordinary it is that it's become this. It's not, it, it shouldn't be normal. It might be normal, but it shouldn't be. People, not just any people, but young, young people. We're talking about young people here who view opposing ideas as physical threats to their safety. And these, again, are people in college, an institution of, of learning, where thinking is supposed to be the whole point of the exercise, where encountering challenging ideas is supposed to be one of the, one of the great benefits of going to a university. See, it's supposed to be old people, old and world-weary people. They're supposed to be the ones who are set in their ways, set in their ideas, set in their opinions, immovable. Uh, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying it's good even for older folks to be that way. I don't think anyone should be that way. But, it, I mean, at least it's understandable if you're a 75-year-old guy uh, and, and you're saying, you know what, this is who I am, this is what I believe, this is what my opinions are. Uh, I'm too old now. I'm not changing this. I, I'm going to ride this out. Even if I'm wrong, I'm riding this thing out uh, to the end because it, it's, I got other things to worry about. In fact, no, I don't want to worry about anything. I'm just going to kick back and relax, I'm not worrying about, about uh, debating you, you little whippersnappers anymore. So I understand that mentality from an older person if you're 75. But 19, 20 and you're going to block out all other ideas at that age? You're supposed to be experimenting with ideas fearlessly at that age. Again, I think you should be doing that at any age. And it's great, too, because it's okay to be wrong, especially when you're young. People expect you to be wrong, so you got nothing to lose. You know, you, when, when, you're, when you're 19, you're in college, you don't have any family, no dependents, not, you, you have no real responsibilities you can be wrong about anything. There's, there's really no consequence to being wrong. People expect it. No one's worried about it. So be as wrong as you want. Um, you know, I think, and, and there, there used to be this stereotype, and you still find this sometimes among college-age kids, where they go, they, they, they go wildly from one extreme to another, and one second you see them, and they're a radical communist, and next thing you know, they're a libertarian, and they're back and forth like a, like a pinball machine, all these different views, and they get very invested in this view, and then they're over here and over there. And back. Um, that actually is good. I think that's, what, that's sort of what youth should be, because you're experimenting with ideas, and you've got that youthful enthusiasm. So when you stumble across an idea that you think is interesting, you get very invested in it, uh, but then, you know, you're still open to other things, so you're reading and you're thinking, and so now next thing you know, you're over there and you're back and forth. That's fine. I think that's what being young should be all about. But now it's become not that at all. Now it's, this is my viewpoint as, as, as 
irrational and deranged as it might be, I'm not changing. This is what I believe. And I simply will not allow myself to even come in contact with any other ideas. Right? This is, these are my ideas, and, and uh, I'm quarantining myself like the coronavirus. I'm quarantining myself. And that, that's how they, I, I did think about that last night. This is, this is how they treat opposing ideas. They treat it like a, if you have an opposing idea, they treat you like you have the coronavirus. And they're going to quarantine you. Stay away. They're, they're just one step away from asking, for, from demanding that you wear a surgical mask so that your opposing ideas don't, don't leak out un, uh, you know, uh, unintentionally and infect somebody. Now, um, so that, that, that's one problem, the, the intellectual cowardice. The other thing is this calling everything bigoted, and th- this is part, of course, the way of, of trying to shut down debate. Call everything bigot and fascist, and you heard in the brochure there, I'm a bigot, fascist, fascist, racist, all of those, all those various ists and phobias. That's the way these things always go, but it has no effect anymore. Nobody cares about being called these things. I don't care at all. People ask me sometimes, how do you deal with the labels? People call you bigoted. And, <laughs> what do you mean, how do I deal with it? I do not care at all. It means nothing to me that has no effect. It should, though. It should mean something to me. It actually should. I, I should care about somebody calling me a bigot because bigotry is real. It's, it's a bad thing to be a bigot. So I think maybe there was a time when you accused somebody of being a bigot. That was a serious charge. But now it, it's, it's so common that I can't afford to care. And this is the analogy that I used yesterday in my talk to try to explain why it works this way now. Let's say that you bought a bottle of rat poison because you have a rat problem in your house. And um, you got the rat poison. Would you then, with your rat poison, go and label every container in your home rat poison just to be cautious? Just to be safe. You're going to call everything rat poison. Well, no, you wouldn't do that because the other people in your home, you know, your kids, your wife, or if you, your, your parents, your, your siblings, now they're not going to be really sure what the real rat poison is because you've called everything rat poisoning. And the result is, after a while, they're going to ignore the labels because they have no choice uh, because it's the only way to function now, and they're going to live their life. The problem is that there actually is rat poison in one of those containers, and now you've just increased the likelihood that someone is going to come in contact with or I- ingest the rat poison because you've negated the effectiveness and the meaning of the label. In a similar way, when you go around reflexively labeling every opinion you don't like, bigotry or fascism, you've made it so that those labels mean nothing. Nobody can take them seriously anymore. And then what do you do when there actually is bigotry or fascism to fight? Do you say, well, you can't, you can't say, hey, look, it's a bigot, it's a fascist. You can't say that. Well, you can, but no one's going to listen. Everyone's going to yawn and say, oh, yeah, well, that's what you said about the last 19,000 people you came in contact with. So, and, and that's really a problem because, again, there is actual, bigotry is a real thing. Fascism is a real thing. There are racists out there. Um, But you've called everyone that. And so not only have you, it's, it's not just that you've made the label meaningless, but now you've, you've really caused more people to go, you know, and end up becoming bigots because when you try to warn someone away from that bigoted worldview, they're going to say, what's what I mean? You call everything bigoted. So now you're saying this is bigoted too? Maybe in this case it actually is, but you have no way of telling them that. You have no word left to describe actual bigotry. I guess this is a, just a way, a way of retelling the boy who cried wolf, I suppose. So I could, I could probably keep it at that. But, uh, and that's, that's what it is. So even if I am a bigot or a fascist, which I don't think I am, but even if I was, you calling me that has no effect. It has no meaning. It has no substance. Because that's what you say about everybody. All right, we're going to get to headlines in a second. Um, But first, time is running out to get 25% off all Daily Wire membership plans using coupon code NEVERSOCIALIST. This is the last week we're giving you this offer. And uh, you, you just... You don't want to miss out on, on the, with everything going wrong in the world right now, 
we're, we're giving you this great offer. You don't want to compound your problems by missing out on this wonderful offer. Uh, Daily Wire members get an ad-free experience, a show library including the Matt Wall Show, the full three hours of the Ben Shapiro Show, access to the mailbag, and now the exclusive election insight op-eds from Ben Shapiro. Daily Wire members also get uh, to ask us questions live, like many of you saw on Super Tuesday coverage of Backstage. Um, along with all this, of course, you get the magnificent, the irreplaceable, the, the, the singular, the beautiful uh, Leftist Tears Tumblr. And if you haven't already, download the Daily Wire app so you can get all of the, our great content on the go with you wherever you go. Again, that's 25% off on Daily Wire memberships for all plans using coupon code NEVERSOCIALIST. So head on over to dailywire.com slash subscribe. The deal is ending this week, so join now. That's dailywire.com slash subscribe. Headlines, number one, Bernie Sanders has officially unveiled his extremist pro-abortion agenda for if he uh, becomes president. He's calling it the Reproductive Justice Plan. Reading, uh, let me read now from a report in one of my favorite websites, LifeSite News. It says, Democrat presidential contender and avowed socialist Senator Bernie Sanders has formally unveiled the abortion agenda he's running on in 2020, collecting in a single location the various absolutist promises he has made to the abortion lobby. The Vermont senator's so-called reproductive health care and justice for all plan pledges to repeal the Hyde Amendment, thereby allowing direct funding of elective abortions with tax dollars, make contraception free and available over the counter, and significantly expand funding for Planned Parenthood, Title 10, and other initiatives that offer and promote abortions. Uh, okay, a lot of problems here, of course. Let's start with funding Planned Parenthood. He wants to dramatically increase funding for Planned Parenthood. They already get half a billion dollars a year. This is a, a, a billion dollar corporation that gets half a billion a year in tax funding. Sanders want to get, wants to give them more. So Sanders, the guy who hates billionaires, hates corporations, is actually okay with giving billions to a corporation. He's the corporate welfare guy now, but only if they kill babies. Think about that. The only corporation that Bernie Sanders likes, and actually likes so much that he wants to give more money to, more than half a billion, is the one that kills babies. This man is a demented freak. Is that harsh? Maybe a little, but deserved. Number two, speaking of Bernie Sanders, uh, he said on Fox yesterday that it would be xenophobic to shut down the border, even in the case of trying to contain a viral pandemic. We're going to move on to the next audience question, but if you had to, if you had to, would you close down the borders? No. I mean, what you don't want to do right now, we have a president who has uh, propagated uh, xenophobic uh, anti-immigrant sentiment from before he was elected. What we need to do is have the scientists take a hard look at what we need to do. There are communities where the virus is spreading. What does that mean? It may mean self-quarantining. It may be not having public assemblies. Uh, but let's not go back to the same old thing. Isn't it interesting that a president who has been demagoguing and demonizing immigrants, the first thing that he could think about is closing down uh, the, the border? Uh, so we need scientists to tell us the appropriate approach, not a political approach. Okay. We see again here that leftist positions are actually religious doctrines. There is no reason at all to oppose shutting down the border in, case, uh, in the case of a pandemic. Unless, it's just an obvious thing that you would do. Unless you believe in a doctrine that says shutting down the border is intrinsically immoral. Controlling the border is intrinsically immoral which is nonsense, obviously, but that's their religious conviction, and that's why they can never be talked out of it. Number three, Representative Paul Gosar is in self-quarantine. Uh, he tweeted something yesterday that went viral for all the wrong reasons. Here's the tweet. He says, been thinking about life and mortality today. I'd rather die gloriously in battle than from a virus. In a way, it doesn't matter, but it kind of does. And there's a picture there of guys in chain link armor sword fighting. And so he's in self-quarantine, worried about the virus, thinking, I'd rather die that way. Which, people are making fun of him. Don't we all feel that way? I, I, you know, I certainly agree. Only personally, I've always imagined and, and hoped that my demise would come when I trip, when I trip running away from some pursuing monster or enemy of some kind. And uh, there's a whole group of us. And then, and then I trip on a, on a route or something. And, uh, and, and I say to the other people, you go on without me. And they stop and they say, no, 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 we, we, we're going to take you. And I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I say, 
I look at them resolutely and I say, no, no, go. And then as they're turning to leave, I say something inspiring like, uh, you know, I'll live on in your heart or not that exactly. I'm workshopping it still a little bit, but of course, uh, but, but the main thing is there is no reason for me to tell them to go on without me because I could have gotten up. You know, in all the movies, the person trips and says, go on without me. You could easily just get up and keep running, but you decided it's not worth the effort, so I'm just going to die. So that, that's my plan anyway. But we all have our dreams. Number four, on the subject of the virus, uh, people in France are throwing caution to the wind in spite of the corona outbreak, and they're doing whatever in the hell this is. Okay, so that was 3,500 people dressed like Smurfs gathering together to break the world record. I'm not sure what the record is exactly, presumably the world record for the most embarrassing thing that a group of people have ever done in their, ever in history. Uh, or maybe it's the world record for most people who've gathered together as Smurfs, which means that there have been other groups and other occasions like this of, of, of smaller groups of people gathering as Smurfs. In fact, this, you know, I mean, this goes back, I believe this is how the Black Plague started. Maybe the Blue Plague, we should call it. All I can say is, if France is ultimately decimated by disease because thousands of people passed it to each other at a giant Smurf gathering, well, there's just something about that that seems appropriate. It's very on brand for France, it seems to me. Uh, number five from the Daily Caller, reading now the report, it says, Pornhub struck back Monday at a petition to shut down the website demanding that the pornography platform be held accountable for the role it's accused of playing in sex trafficking and allowing child rape films. Director of Abolition for Exodus Cry, uh, Lila Micklewait, told the Daily Wire News, the Daily Caller News Foundation, I should say, that she has focused her efforts for the past eight years on the connection between pornography, sex trafficking, and sexual exploitation. Her change.org petition calls for the government to shut down Pornhub and hold its executives accountable for aiding trafficking, and it's garnered more than 400,000 signatures since it was created February 10th. The petition criticizes Pornhub for allegedly failing to have a system to reliably verify the age and consent of those depicted in pornography. Uh, and it goes off there. Pornhub has responded saying that this is wrong and this is a radical right-wing attempt to shut us down and, uh, and so on. Now, I think we'll talk more in detail about this later on in the week because this is worth, worth, worth focusing on more uh, intently. But we've talked about the issue of trying to ban porn. And I realize that on that position, I am very much in a minority, which I'm in a minority in a lot of my positions, so I'm used to it. But even if you, no matter how you feel about banning porn, let's, let's put that conversation to the side for a moment. We should be able to agree, at a minimum, as decent, rational people, that a website like Pornhub, that has billions of hours of pornography, it's the largest porn site in the world by a mile, uh, and, 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 and many of those videos, many, many, many thousands of hours of that content consists of rape, porn, and child porn. Um, I, I think we should be able to agree that a company like that should face some regulations, at least some controls, and it should be required by law to put, a, to put something in place to verify that the content it's allowing on its platform is not rape or child molestation. We should be able to agree on that. They should be for, required by law to ensure that they are not allowing child porn and rape films on their platforms. And they should also be required by law to make sure that the people viewing to put, they, they, there should be some age restrictions on the content, and there should be so, they, they should have to put something in place to ensure that the people viewing the content are not kids. Because as it stands right now, you know, just having to click, yes, I'm 18, that's not going to cut it. There should be something more. Something like you have to provide an ID. You know, there, there are many ways you could go about this. And it's, no matter what you do, okay, it's, it's not going to be 100% but it'll be a lot better than what it is now, where there is effectively no filter put in place whatsoever to stop kids from getting on the, 
getting on the site. And so Pornhub is making millions of dollars on showing porn to kids. And they know that's what they're doing. In fact, they even market to kids. If you look at the way that they market, especially on social media, it is obviously tailored oftentimes to kids. So this, again, we should be able to agree. And the only, I guess the, what you might say is, well, but if Pornhub is required to make sure they're not showing rape films and child porn, that might be too onerous and it would shut down the company. Okay. What, what is, that? is that supposed to be some sort of dystopian Worst case scenario, you know what, if you can't run your company without ensuring that your business doesn't involve showing child porn and rape films to, to millions of people, you know, if that is an integral part of your business and there's no way for you to weed it out without your, your, your company itself shutting down, well, to me, that's a really good indication that your company should shut down. Uh, all right, let's go to your daily cancellation before we have uh, emails here in a moment. Today, I have a rather somber cancellation that I have to do. I don't want to have to do this. It's not something that a parent ever wants to do, but it is something that I think many parents find uh, that they must do. There, there comes a time. And so I must cancel my kids today, at least the older ones. The twin, six years old, and I guess my, my younger son, three years old, uh, I'm going to have to cancel him as well. They're all canceled. I, can't, I, informed them, I, for, I informed them this morning, you're all canceled. Canceled, canceled, canceled while they're eating breakfast. And let me explain why, and I, I think you'll, you'll sympathize. Over the weekend, actually it was on Saturday, uh, Saturday morning, I was excited to finally show to my kids, and this is something I've been, I've been waiting to do this for six years. And I I, I felt like the time is now that they're ready. And so I decided that uh, I was going to show the kids the movie Space Jam. Now, as a kid, Space Jam was, for me, one of the great cinematic classics. How could you not love it? Combining Michael Jordan and Bugs Bunny. It's just, it's two worlds colliding. It's it's like a a dream come true. Uh, I probably, Space Jam came out when I think I was like nine. I probably watched it 40 times the first year it came out. It was funny, it was dramatic, it was inspirational, it was suspenseful, it was at times sad but ultimately uplifting. Uh, Jordan's acting was superb. He was able to portray two entire emotions, mildly amused and mildly concerned. And those that was his range, it, 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 an incredible acting range. I think, I'm betting that Daniel Day-Lewis, as he was watching Space Jam, which I'm sure he has, when he, when he first saw it, he fell into deep despair knowing that he would never be able to act as well as Michael Jordan. So the point is, this was a hugely influential movie to me in my life. And finally, it was time on a Saturday morning, hearkening back to my days of watching Looney Tunes on a Saturday morning. That's why I chose a Saturday morning. Everything was right. Time to show the kids the movie. And they were not impressed at all. They hardly pay att- paid attention through the whole thing didn't take it seriously, no respect for the artistry on display, no respect um, for my childhood and my emotional attachment to this movie. And finally, when it was over and I asked them what they thought, my daughter said her exact words, it was kind of weird and boring, daddy, sorry. And then my son said that it reminded him a little bit of Zootopia because of the bunny, except Zootopia is good. That was what he said. And I'll tell you why it hurt so much. It was the realization, realization that my kids are uncultured Philistines who wouldn't know great art if it fell on their head like a cartoon anvil. And and, and, and by the way, which, which they also don't understand is the height of comedy. An anvil falling on someone's head and they're squished down like a pancake. Nothing is funnier than that. Happens in Space Jam, they don't even crack a smile. I'm telling you right now, I, this, this weekend I've decided I'm gonna show my kids the never-ending story um, as, we, as we do this tour of my childhood films. And if they don't like that one, I'm calling the adoption agency. I, it's, it's done, enough is enough. You gotta put your foot down. 
All right, now let's go to uh, emails. And you can email the show if you become a member of The Daily Wire. You get access to the, to the, uh, to the mailbag. And we'll answer. We'll get to one uh, email here. And then, uh, and then we also have, as I said, Andrew, who's going to tell me why I'm wrong. All right, this is from Rachel. It says, Dear Galactic Lord Dictator and Culinary King, I'm hoping you can pass along your culinary skills slash expertise. I have noticed that whenever I uh, have a meal at a restaurant and enjoy it and then try to replicate it at home, there's always something missing. I can never get it to taste the same. I'm not sure I've ever made a, quote, restaurant quality meal in my life. Where am I going wrong? Well, Rachel, um, I would need to know, and don't take this the wrong way, but I would need to know your race and your location to answer this question. Without that information, there's not much I can tell you because I, I haven't had your cooking, which sounds like, thank God I haven't. But uh, the reason I need to know your race and location is that if you are white and not from the South, so if you're a white Yankee, then I could tell you without having your cooking, I could tell you right now exactly what it is. I could tell you what the problem is with 100% certainty. You're using, you're not using enough butter. You're not using enough seasoning. Um, white Northerners have had this problem for centuries now. This is, you know, I think this is one of the things the Civil War was over. The food is bland, butterless. See, what you have to understand about restaurants, restaurants put butter on everything. If you're asking why, are, why is food so good at restaurants, it's because they put globs of butter on everything. They put a, if, if you're having green beans at a restaurant, they put, a, they put a, a gallon of butter on it. Doesn't matter, vegetables, meat, everything. Butter, butter, butter. That's why it tastes so good. And uh, that's why food in the South tastes good. In the South, they understand this. They are just taking dump trucks of butter and putting it on everything they make down there. They even, they even, you walk into a house in the South, they, they cover the walls and the, and, the, and, the, and the floor with butter. Everything has butter. And the food is great. Of course, that's why so many Southerners are obese. I think eight of the fattest 10 states of, in the Union are, are in the South. But it's, it's, it's worth it for the great food. And then seasoning. This, again, is a problem among white Northerners. Not nearly enough se seasoning. Um, so if you're in that category, you should be using, and I say this, by the way, as a, as a, white, per, as a white Northerner myself. Okay, So I'm allowed to say everything that I'm saying right now. These are, these are insulting stereotypes. They are absolutely true. And uh, so the other thing is the seasoning problem. Now, you, and I have to tell myself this because my, for, and I've had to overcome this. My, I realize that my first inclination is to use about a quarter of the seasoning that I should be. So I need to, when, when it feels like I've used enough seasoning, put four times that amount on. Uh, that's the rule of thumb. Now, if you're making a steak or something, a really nice cut of meat, it's a little bit different. In that case, you're putting salt. You're using the butter. The butter rule still applies, but you want to let the flavors of the meat come out. The salt's going to help with that. Uh, you don't want to drown it in seasoning in that case. But if, uh, for, for any dish that is not a very nice cut of meat, you want the seasoning. I was at a, uh, someone's house the other day, and they were making tacos. And uh, I watched them put one packet of the store-bought taco seasoning on two pounds of ground beef. Horrifying. Now, you shouldn't be using the packets anyway. You should make that at home but because you should have a spice cabinet that has everything that the taco seasoning is in. That, that's in the taco seasoning. But if you're using the packets, you want at least three of them for that amount of meat, if not four. All right, let's go to uh, why I'm wrong. This is from Andrew. It says, hi, Matt. I attended your talk at College Park last, Park last night. Uh, it was the University of Maryland. I really enjoyed it and thought you gave easily the best speech of any conservative I've seen on, I've seen on campus. Uh, but I did have a problem with one argument you made. Okay, well, you just ruined it. So you compliment me, and then you, and then you tell me that I'm wrong. Didn't get a chance to talk to you about it in the Q&A. You said that only heterosexual people should be able to get married because only that union can serve as the basis of the family because only they can procreate. But you didn't adequately address the fact that some heterosexual unions are not fertile and same-sex unions can still adopt. How does this not destroy your argument? Uh, well, hi, Andrew. I think I did address that. Um, it's true, of course, that some straight couples can't have kids. In fact, every straight couple is in that boat eventually if they stay together and if, if, uh, if they live long enough. Also, it's true that same-sex couples can adopt. 
But none of this has any bearing on my point. My point is that hetero, the heterosexual union, in principle, has the capacity to create life. And this capacity sets it apart from any other union. In a similar way, you know, I might say that human beings, in principle, have two arms and two legs. Meaning these are fundamental features. As a general rule, human beings have two arms and two legs. If somebody were to say to you, describe what a human being looks like, you're going to say, you're going you're gonna to give a description, and it's going to include two arms and two legs. Just like if I ask you, what does an elephant look like? In your description, you're going to mention the, the, uh, the trunk, right? That's what in principle is, general rule. Now, a person can lose an arm. A person can be born with a deformity and not have any legs. Does this make them not human? Well, of course not. But uh, the, the point is that they would have arms and legs if not for the mutation or disease or injury that caused uh, things to be different for them. So they are exceptions, but they are exceptions that prove the rule because if someone has one arm or no legs, you automatically know that something went wrong. Automatically. You know that there was an injury, there was a, there was a, 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 a mutation, there was an illness. You know that for sure because they're not supposed to be that way. And we know they're not supposed to be that way because we know, in principle, what a human being is supposed to look like. Now, what happens if a spaceship lands and creatures come out of the spaceship and uh, all the creatures have eight arms and four legs? Be a little top-heavy, but, well, in that case, we would know that these creatures, whatever they are, are not human. This is not a case of a minority of people who happen to have fewer limbs than they ought to have because of some misfortune that befell them. No, now we have a whole race of creatures who, it would appear, in principle, have uh, eight legs or eight arms and four legs or whatever it is. So they aren't human. That doesn't mean they have less moral value necessarily than human beings do. It just means that they're something different. They are something other. We would call them something different. We wouldn't call them human. Okay, back to marriage. We have two things here to consider. One thing is the heterosexual union, which in principle has, or at one point had, barring illness or deformity, the capacity to, in itself, create new life. The other thing, the homosexual union, in principle does not have, and has never had, and can never have, and will never have, the capacity to, in itself, create new life. Uh, so these are two things that are, in principle, different. We don't even need to get into the moral valuations right now. They're just different. I, I, I'm trying to get you to, to that point of acknowledging the difference. And they're different in, an, in a powerful and important way. One of these things creates people. The other does not. I mean, imagine if the rather than marital unions, we were talking about machines. And you had one machine that created people and another machine that didn't do that. Okay, well, these are different machines, right? And you probably, you wouldn't give them the same name. Uh, and, and you would probably uh, come to the conclusion that the, the, the uh, people-making machine is probably a little bit more important because of what it does, because of the function, because of its purpose. So my argument is the thing that creates people should have a different name, be called something different, and should be valued by and protected by society more simply because of its crucial importance to society. Everyone says, well, maybe the answer is to get the government out of marriage. The reason the government, the state, had a vested interest in marriage is because of its procreative potential. And so that, that makes it a, a, something that everybody is concerned with. It doesn't mean that the, the entire world can barge into your marriage and dictate terms and, and, and have a say in everything you do. It's just that uh, there's a real interest in protecting and, and uh, encouraging the, that marital union because it, it, it serves as the basis for the formation of new life and, and the family. And the family is the foundation of human civilization. And so, of course, human civilization is interested in it. Now, the same-sex union... Uh, doesn't have that capacity, so society has no real interest in it. The state has no real interest in it. And that, again, is a apart from any moral valuation. It's just, it's, there's not any, 
You just, why does society need to protect the union of, 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 of two people who are you know, living together or, or what have you, but there's no procreative potential there? Uh, and, and so that's the difference. That's, that's my point. Just I remember that phrase, in principle. And so that, that, I think, will help navigate all these exceptions and uh, sterility and infertility and all the things that you're mentioning, Andrew. And we'll leave it there. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks for listening. Uh, Godspeed. Oh, and remember, buy my book, Church of Cowards. Godspeed. Okay. The Matt Wall Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring, supervising producer Mathis Glover, Supervising producer Robert Sterling, technical producer Austin Stevens, editor Danny D'Amico, audio mixer Robin Fenderson. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production, copyright Daily Wire 2020. Hey everybody, it's Andrew Claven, host of The Andrew Claven Show. You know, some people are depressed because the American Republic is collapsing, the end of days is approaching, and the moon has turned to blood. But on The Andrew Claven Show, that's where the fun just gets started. So come on over to The Andrew Claven Show and laugh your way through the apocalypse with me. Andrew Clayton.